Okay, so uh, welcome to this next video in which we're discussing pulmonary arterial hypertension. Now, so far what we've discussed is that we're going to have um, some abnormal endothelial function which is going to result in the endothelium uh, secreting less nitric oxide. That means the activation of the soluble guanylate cyclase is going to go down. So the amount of cyclic GMP in the smooth muscle cell is going to go down. That means that the activation of protein kinase G is going to go down. So now what we want to see is why protein kinase G uh, activation going down uh, is going to lead to contraction of that smooth muscle cell. Okay, so we want to see what protein kinase does that is pro-relaxant there for, and why uh, a reduction in its activity is going to therefore cause contraction. Okay, right, so let's draw out our generic smooth muscle cell here, and let's try and understand how smooth muscle cells contract. So in order to do this, we firstly need to have a little bit of an insight into smooth muscle um, structure, basically. Now, smooth muscle cells are called smooth muscle cells because they do not have striations. If you look at them down a, a light microscope, they don't have striations, and this is because the contractile units are not all aligned with one another. Uh, what causes the striations in skeletal muscle cells is that the contractile units are all perfectly aligned with one another, and that gives you the A bands and the I bands because the A bands are where all of the um, all of the um, um, all of the um, myosin filaments are, and the I bands are where all of the um, where there isn't myosin, basically. Okay, so in smooth muscle, it's not like that. They're not aligned in that way. Instead, what you have within the cytoplasm of the smooth muscle cell, you have lots of structures known as dense bodies. So I'll draw these here. So these are dense bodies. So this is a dense body. And then um, in, the, uh, in the membrane of the smooth muscle cell, you then have structures known as attachment plaques. And let me draw several of these in as well. So these are meant to be attachment plaques. Okay, so let me label one of these up, and I'll color them in as well. So this is an attachment plaque. Attachment plaque. And basically, what you're going to have is you're going to have loads of contractile units uh, suspended between this array of dense bodies within the cytoplasm of the smooth muscle cell, shown here in pink, and also these attachment plaques in the membrane of the smooth muscle cell. So these are attachment plaques here. Sorry, these are dense bodies that I've colored in pink. And then, not in that color, um, in turquoise then, we're going to colour in the attachment plaques, and these are these structures in the cell membrane off which uh, contractile units can attach. Okay, so these are attachment plaques. Okay, right. Then, uh, suspended between the attachment plaques and the dense bodies, and also between uh, dense bodies themselves, you're going to have contractile units. So let me show you a contractile unit. Basically, from the dense body, you're going to have actin filaments attached. Okay, so from both dense bodies, you'll have these actin filaments coming out here. So these are actin filaments. Okay, and then suspended in the middle of these two um, clusters of actin filaments, you're then going to have a um, protein disc, which then has myosin filaments uh, coming the both ways, okay, like so. So let me now highlight those in specific colors. So that's highlight in green the actin filaments. So in green, here are the actin filaments, like so. Okay, so these are actin filaments. And then suspended from that protein disc in the middle, you then have myosin filaments, and we'll do these in orange. So in orange, these are myosin filaments. Okay, and that, re that disc, that protein disc in the center from wh whence the um, myosin filaments come, uh, that's... Um, that's where the myosin filaments come from. Okay, so that overall is the structure of a contractile unit. So this is the um, this is the unit of contraction within smooth muscle cells, and what is it? The unit of contraction within all uh, muscle cells. So this is the contractile unit. And basically, when you stimulate contraction of this smooth muscle cell, what's going to happen is these myosin filaments are going to climb up the actin filaments. 
and this, these myosin filaments on this side are going to climb up these actin filaments, and these ones on this side are going to climb up these actin filaments. And if you um, look at this, it doesn't make any sense because you can't have the um, myosin um, myosin disc here in the centre moving in both directions. So instead, what ends up happening is that the dense bodies are pulled, the actin filaments are pulled inwards, and that causes the contraction of this contractile unit. Okay, now you won't just have one of these in a smooth muscle cell, you'll have multiple. And if I now just denote the whole contractile unit by an orange box, you'll have contractile units between these uh, attachment plaques and these dense bodies, you'll have contractile units between uh, well, again, between an attach a dense body and an attachment plaque, you'll have them all around, basically. You'll have these huge, great array of um, contractile units suspended amongst the dense bodies and the attachment plaques within the smooth muscle cell. So that, if you can imagine what's going to happen now, if you activate contraction of all of these contractile units within the smooth muscle cell, what's going to start happening? Well, all of these are going to contract, and if all of them contract, what's going to happen? Everything's going to shrink down. The entire cell is going to shrink when you activate the contraction of these contractile units, basically. Okay, so that's what's going to happen if you activate the contraction of these contractile units. Now, how do you activate the myosin filaments to climb up the my um, sorry? How do you activate the myosin filaments to climb up the actin filaments? Well, in order to do that, you need to phosphorylate the myosin heads, and then they'll begin the process of cross bridge cycling, uh, wh whereby they can move up the actin filaments. Okay, so how do you phosphorylate the myosin heads? Right, so in order to phosphorylate the uh, myosin heads, what usually happens is that calcium levels go up within the cytoplasm of the smooth muscle cell. Okay, so when calcium goes up within the cytoplasm of the smooth muscle cell, what's going to happen is that calcium is going to bind to a protein known as calmodulin. Now, let me show you the structure of calmodulin. So, Calmodulin has a structure that in cartoons is usually shown like so. Okay, so it has these two lobes here. So let's say this is the N lobe, and this is the C lobe. Okay, so there are two lobes. One's called the N lobe, and one's called the C lobe. And both of these lobes have calcium binding sites on them, and they have two calcium binding sites. So both the N lobe and the C lobe have two calcium binding sites. Okay, and these calcium binding sites are specifically what are known as EF hand domains. Okay, so let me explain to you what an EF hand domain is. Basically, an EF hand domain is a uh, polypeptide structure, it's a protein structure which is capable of binding and responding to calcium. Okay, so the structure of an EF hand domain looks like this. If this line represents the polypeptide, then it goes round in a loop like so, and the amino acids in this loop region down here, those are generally are uh, all acidic amino acid residues, i.e. their R groups are acidic groups. Now, if they're acidic groups, that means that they can donate protons. Now, when they donate their proton away, they are going to get a negative charge. So what's left over after you've removed that proton off the acid is going to have a negative charge. So let me give you an example. Let's start, have the amino acid aspartate. So let's draw out the structure of the amino acid aspartate. So start with just the basic structure of an amino acid, which is common to all amino acids. Okay, so here's the alpha carbon, here's the amino group, here's the carboxylic acid group here, so that's the amino acid that's um, in the name. And then the specific part, the part that's specific to aspartic acid, is that you have this sort of ethanoic acid group sticking off the side like so. So this structure is the structure of aspartic acid. Aspartic acid. So this is an acidic uh, side chain that an amino acid can have. And the reason it's acidic is that it can donate this proton here of the hydroxyl group. And when it does that, what will happen to this carboxyl group 
is that you'll get this carboxyl group with a negative charge on this oxygen, and the proton has gone off, basically. Now, you can see that this, uh, what's left over is basically going to have a negative charge. So that means that if we put a lot of acidic residues uh, in this loop, we're going to end up with a lot of residues that are in fact negatively charged. Now that's ideal, basically, uh, for coordinating a divalent cation like calcium. So let's say this is our calcium cation, because it's got two positive charges. So it's going to interact quite nicely with the negative charges on these R groups of the amino acids in this EF ham domain. Okay, just a bit of notation now. Um, well, nomenclature. Uh, so aspartic acid strictly is this molecule when you have the hydrogen still attached to the oxygen. When you have the molecule, what's left of the molecule, i.e. Um, the amino acid where it's lost this hydrogen off here, that is what's referred to as aspartate. Now, people often use these interchangeably, but strictly, aspartic acid refers to the molecule where it's still got its proton to donate, and aspartate refers to the molecule when it's lost its proton, the so-called conjugate base of aspartate, uh, sorry, of aspartic acid. Okay, and the reason it's called the conjugate base is because it is, in fact, a base. Uh, and the reason it's a base is that this oxygen here with this negative charge can now receive a proton. So this structure, the aspartate structure, uh, where you have lost this proton, it's now a base because it can receive a proton back. So it's gone from being an acid to being a base by losing its proton. And that concept, uh, when you've got this base left over from uh, the acid losing its proton, that's called the conjugate base, basically. Okay, right, so the conjugate bases of these amino acid residues, once they've lost their protons, will have negative charges, and therefore it's ideal for coordinating a calcium uh, cation. So, uh, EF hand domains are rarely found on their own in a protein structure. Instead, what you often find is that they're together in dimers. So you'll often find that you have two of them next to each other. So you'll have another uh, EF hand domain here. And that, that when you've got two EF hand domains next to each other, that's known as an EF dimer, basically. Okay, and these EF dimers are what you have in uh, calmodulin. You have one EF dimer for each lobe, and that's how you get these two calcium binding sites on each lobe of calmodulin, because you've got these two calcium binding sites now on the EF dimer. Okay, now the st structure, this protein at the moment does not have calcium bound to it, and when calmodulin is, calmodulin is in this unbound state, it's known as apocalmodulin, okay? Or for short, it's often denoted apocam, okay? C, lowercase a, and then capital M. So that's apocalmodulin. Now, when calcium binds to those four calcium binding sites on the apocalmodulin, what's going to happen is you're going to get a change in conformation. So let me show this. The two lobes, the N and the C lobe, are going to move further apart, and this linker polypeptide between the two lobes is going to adopt a alpha helical structure. It previously was a linear polypeptide, but now it's going to adopt an alpha helical structure, like so. Okay, so uh, the linker peptide between the two lobes adopts an alpha helical structure, and uh, the two lobes move further apart, so it's sort of um, it extends out, in effect. So now it's got calcium bound to these four binding sites. So I'll fill them in with an orange uh, dot to demonstrate that it's got calcium bound to it. And this structure is now known as a calcium calmodulin complex. Calcium calmodulin complex. Or again, it's often abbreviated to uh, Ca2 plus for calcium and then C, lowercase a, capital M, for calmodulin, so cal cal calcium cam, Ca2 plus cam. Okay, right. Now, these calcium calmodulin complexes are then going to activate 
an enzyme known as myosin nitrogen kinase, which is going to phosphorylate the myosin uh, heads, basically. But we'll see that in the next video.